Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Laverne Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Oh, we have an adventure today. Our guest today is Rinker Buck. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Well, you've done this extraordinary adventure. You wrote a book, mm -hmm. The Oregon Trail, A New American Journey, and this details your personal voyage for four months on the 21, 2200 mile. yeah. miles Oregon Trail. Right. So right. Um, now we have a li we're a little partial to the Santa Fe Trail sure. here. So you'll have to tell us what differences and similarities mm -hmm. there are. But what of us hasn't driven in our cars across the continent, seen those mountains, and wondered how the heck did those wagon trains ever do it? And you actually did it. Right. We decided we, we ended up be becoming, I didn't really planned for this, but we ended up becoming the uh, first in over 100 years to make what they call an unassisted crossing. Unassisted means we didn't have uh, battalions of pickup trucks and stuff following us across with kids. Or luxury or R RVs with no showers and everything. If you go on the line, you can see that they offer pioneer wagon trips and everything, but they're all catered meals and all that kind of stuff. We didn't, we didn't want to do that. The difference between the Oregon Trail and the Santa Fe Trail was the Santa Fe Trail was earlier. It was a big freight route um, from the sort of English-speaking colonies way back uh, across the Mississippi <coughs> and the Mexican <coughs> uh, Empire up, up here prior to 1846 when, when uh, we fought the Mexican-American War. But the Santa Fe Trail was primarily a freight route. It, wasn't, it didn't carry pioneers uh, who were going to come to settle these lands. And one of the reasons that the Santa Fe Trail is not as well preserved, although we know the route, um, is that uh, it's pretty intensively farmed in parts of Kansas and Colorado and so forth. And so m a lot of the evidence of the, of the old trail has disappeared. Whereas the Oregon Trail, um, because it was in a more northern area, a very unsettled, and it's only sort of big cattle ranches and stuff through there now, there's some paved sections of it, <coughs> um, it was just easier to preserve. It just became preserved, much much easier. So the Oregon Trail was, they say, the largest overland migration right. in the New World, and 400,000 settlers. It was actually over a million over time, because ah. between 1843 and the Civil War, about 400,000 um, pioneers came. They were mainly people who'd lost their farms in the East, or people who were tired uh, of religious battles in the East, and that, and that sort of thing and they were going to get free land uh, in Oregon because it was our design to flood the Northwest Territories with pioneers uh, so that we could take that off, take it over from the British. Um, but after the Civil War, another four or 500,000 homesteaders crossed, and they were still in covered wagons, and the stagecoach uh, followed the Oregon Trail route exactly So uh, because the pioneers had already pioneered the right trail. So well over a million people crossed uh, in the 19th century. Wow. wow. And what percentage arrived intact, alive? I, th I think, uh, Roughly. I, I guess the percentage would be 80%, something like that. But we do know that uh, over 20,000 people died of cholera, particularly oh. along the Nebraska stretch over all those years. So uh, it, it was, there, was, there was a lot of risk and there was a lot of death. Well, there were breakdowns. There was dysentery, cholera, mud. Mm -hmm. Right. Just um, getting across the rivers was <coughs> uh, particularly dangerous. The pioneers benefited in the first 15 or 20 years from uh, the native tribes, particularly the Sioux, who were great river men, and would uh, show the pioneers how to put logs under their wagons, and or they would wrap uh, the bottom of the wagon in buffalo hides, hmm. which was ver which could make them very buoyant. Ah. But uh, it, w it was very dangerous. Uh, children were crushed by the wheels just being kids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that was the same as 19th century America, where uh, wagon travel through cities and towns and stuff could be very dangerous if kids weren't careful. So let's have a look. Mm -hmm. It was you, your brother Nick, 
Mm -hmm. his dog, Olive Oil, right. three mules, and a restored 19th century covered wagon. Right. So mm -hmm. tell us a little about what, 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 it was, what the setup was. Well, we, we used three mules up front because I, pulled, because I didn't want to have pickup assistance and that sort of thing. I was pulling an extra cart in the back that, w that matched the wagon. It was actually a pretty common hitch in, in the 19th century. Actually, here's a, let's look at the, the back view so you sure. can see that. And that cart in the back, which I designed and had built myself, um, held about 1,500 pounds of hay, oats, water, etc. And that's what allowed us to be independent and just wander the plains following the trail all the way across. Um, and, and, and we used a three mule hitch because I needed the third mule once I added that extra cargo wagon. Now, why mules? Why not oxen or horse? Well, the pioneers only used mules or oxen. And of course, oxen were more popular because they were less expensive. I grew up on a horse farm, which is sort of why this was possible. And there was no way I was going to drive oxen across, all right? And I don't even know anything about how to hitch oxen. They're very hard to find and, and to drive them. Uh, but you use mules and not horses, and uh, it's very well documented, even when Mark Twain crossed in the 1860s at a point in Nebraska where the real desert dry country begins, they switched out their horses for mules uh, on the stagecoach. Uh, mules have uh, much more endurance. Uh, they can take uh, being denied water for longer periods, and they're very, very sure-footed. Uh, they get from their burrow side the, the, a 270-degree vision. They can see their rear feet, mm. oh. uh, and a horse cannot see its rear feet, so they're, they're much more sure-footed. Uh, but the mules, uh, and they're very intelligent and wonderful to work with, but uh, uh, they were, once you get into the hot so-called Great American Desert, y you better have a mule because the horse can't last in that heat. And they have such personalities. I really did fall in love with Jake. Your you like Jake, yeah. Idea. Jake was, yeah. Jake was uh, kind of a gentle giant, very sweet guy. I would come over every morning and want to nestle his face uh, under my arm. And uh, the two Molly mules didn't like me as much and when I visited them back on the retirement farm where I left them in Idaho they as soon as they hear my voice when I get out of the car it's you know they take off oh <laughs> uh, but but Butte was a little lazy and Beck was a little crazy and uh, but yeah they all had three distinct personalities it's pretty pretty miraculous in a way that we got all three of them across without any major mishap with the mules but uh, they were a great team one of my favorite parts is when you're beginning and your brother shows up and he's really good with driving horses and can fix everything. Right. And you packed differently oh, for yeah. this expedition. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, what happened was my brother lives in me and we come from a large family. What happens very commonly in large family, I have 10 brothers and sisters, is the experience that the kids in the middle or the end have is totally different from the experience that the kids uh, at the beginning had. So the older kids all went to private schools and Catholic colleges and, and all that kind of stuff. And then the middle boys came along, and my parents were at that point winded as parents. And I was like, well, what's Nikki up to? We don't care. We don't know. You know? Yeah. So he had a very different upbringing, a very different life than I had, kind of, kind of blue collar and, and so forth. And so what happened with Nick um, is he had broken his foot working on a construction project so he was available for the project and he's a much better horseman and a, and a really great mechanic and he showed up for us to then leave for Missouri to pick up the mules in the wagon and he saw all the junk I had packed for the trip. Well let's give exhibit A of a couple oh, of you know, I had my, you thought might come in here. I had my, you know, oh I was, you know, the Brooks Brothers bathrobe is really going to help you get across the Oregon Trail, <laughs> the shoe shine kit, the um, uh, the bocce ball said, you know, uh -huh. I really need that. And pasta cooker, things like that. <laughs> and he's gone, Rink, get rid of this crap. And then what I did was I snuck it uh, past him and hid it in little wells in our pickup truck so he couldn't see it. And then I s hid it bit behind the hay and everything when we got to Missouri. And then just after 24 hours in a wagon, 24 hours in a wagon can be very transformative, I realized get rid of this crap you know we don't need it and we we stacked it into uh bags and i dropped it off near the presbyterian church in hiawatha kansas uh thinking they could use it for an attic cell and it makes for a funny scene in the book 
Well, also, uh, you said that in the original wagon trains when they mm -hmm. go, it was like one of the biggest littering experience because they too would bring things like pianos and things. And the struggle to actually transport this stuff, you mm -hmm. needed to, and so they would just jettison things. The, uh, yes, one historian calls them the greatest litter bugs in history. Yeah. What happened was, it's a portrait of, the reason I was motivated to write the book is that the portrait of America that emerges is so much truer than what they taught us in history class or the Hollywood westerns and so forth. But what happened is the pioneers would get to the Missouri River, which was the jumping off area, and there were all kinds of scare tactics were used to convince them that their children would die if they didn't have, you know, a barrel of bacon for each one of them and that sort of thing. And then they got out into the hills of Kansas and eastern Nebraska and they realized that their draft animals just couldn't pull this up any kind of incline. So they started jettisoning all that material. And the, the uh, outfitters, the merchants back in St. Joe and Independence, knowing full well that that would happen, would hide their own wagons behind the bluffs and then as soon as the covered wagon had passed, take all those barrels and take them back to Independence and sell them to the next train of suckers. You know, So um, there was so much thrown out and so many wagon wrecks and, and so forth and carcasses of oxen and mules that by the 1850s, after about 10 years of trail experience, at which point, you know, a couple hundred thousand people would have crossed, you could literally, this is honestly the truth, you could literally navigate all the way to Oregon or California just by following the debris pile. Hmm. Hmm. Now, one thing that I wouldn't venture home without were, were flashlights. You're going to be out yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. But tell us what happened to all, every flashlight, actually anything yeah. high-tech that you brought. The whole thing about the trip was once you place yourself in an antique-covered wagon pulled by a team of mules and you place yourself in that 19th century mode of everything, you're going to be, your life is going to be determined by that no matter what you want to do. So flashlights... Uh, Coleman lanterns, uh, we tried everything, little sterno lights, all this stuff. They just can't take the jostling of the wagon, uh, the constant bumps and everything. So we just adjusted, we changed our lifestyle. We didn't have light, we, no artificial light. We got up with the dawn in the morning and harnessed the mules and left. And at night we, we were always pretty careful. There were a few nights when we s stayed out, drove later than dark. but. At night, we were always pretty careful to stop by 7 o'clock, get our food and everything, and, and, and get the mules all settled, and then just go to bed. We didn't have any—after any, any about two weeks, we just gave up on artificial light. We just lived dawn to dusk. That, that's how we lived. But if the jostling and the bumping is so much so that it disassembles every mm -hmm. flashlight, how did it feel physically for you to be bouncing along for four months? The first— two weeks we both had very sore backs mm. and then whatever set of muscles is required to sit on a hard seat all day the other physical uh, came along the other physical challenge was um, the, a wagon is very soporific the bouncing the dust the sun the wind on your face all the time um, makes you very very tired and I'd find myself sort of swaying and almost falling off I'd have to catch myself by one of the hoops that held up the canvas or the brake. And so I started walking every day quite a bit mm. uh, to get my circulation back. And, you know, I'd make my brother promise when I got off to ride behind the, to walk behind the wagon that uh, he wouldn't let me get out of sight because the mules walk a lot faster than I could. Yeah. And of course he'd daydream off and forget it and I'd be walking across the plains all alone <laughs> without a vision of its sight of the covered wagon. but. Well, you went through such beautiful countryside. Oh, my goodness. This is, uh, the, you, you, for example, the, the trail parallel the Sweetwater River. The Oregon Trail worked for the pioneers because they needed the great river valleys of the west to be on the water so that they could have game, uh, timber for their fires, water, of course. And the, the, so you went from the Platte, which empties into the Sweetwater, which gets you across Wyoming and into... Uh, uh, things like the, uh, the Big Sandy River and then Ham's Fork and so forth. And yeah, it was just a beautiful riverine route and the sweet water is particularly gorgeous and just this meandering water and it's such a contrast, such a beautiful contrast because here you are in the great American desert and everything all around you is completely dry. But there's this beautiful river with swamps next to it and everything just cutting through the middle of that and just for a mile or so you, you actually have kind of an, an oasis. And then also uh, 
this is you uh, by the by Birch Creek, but yeah. fields of wildflowers. The fields of wildflowers, so yeah, and they actually played an important role. The, the fields of wildflowers were extraordinarily beautiful, even though you're in ostensibly a desert. But they actually played a very important role in American history because for the first 20 years, the pioneers were destined for Oregon, or after 1849, the gold rush for California, the gold fields near Sacramento. But as they crossed, they noticed the wildflowers, and they knew that the land would be arable. With just a little bit of irrigation, that land would support other plants. And in letters home and everything, which is how information was exchanged, everyone knew that the Nebraska Territory and parts of Wyoming that they were crossing, Kansas, could be settled by pioneers someday. And then what happened is, after 1847 and the Mormons got to Salt Lake, uh, word got out that over a thousand miles of ditches for irrigation had been dug in the first 10 years that the Mormons were there. So then we knew that we could settle this country. And so the wildflowers played a very important role because they convinced Americans that this land would eventually be forming. Try and think of America today without, say, Kansas and Nebraska as our corn belt. Well, we're speaking today with Rinker Buck, who wrote this wonderful book, The Oregon Trail. Um, you had a sign on you, because as I'm thinking sure. of these vast things, and tell us what the sign said. So part of the, part of the road was actually paved. This is mm -hmm. you in, in Missouri with yes. your mule team on the paved part of the road. Right. But part of it, and so when you're on the paved part, there are probably irate motorists yeah. who wonder what three mules and a wagon train are doing and they, they're late for lunch or their doctor's yeah. appointment. But you had the sign. Tell us what the sign said. Yeah. Well, when we were kids, we'd taken a shorter covered wagon trip with my father down to Pennsylvania from our New Jersey farm. And he had a sign painted up because even though New Jersey and Pennsylvania in those days were much less developed than today, he had a sign painted up that said, uh, uh, we're sorry for the delay, but we want our children to, and then in big, bold type, see America slowly. And then they gave the route. So we still had that sign. It was, it was hanging in my brother Nick's uh, living room up in Maine. And I called him one day, and, and the sign on the back had never been painted. It was just dry board now. So we painted on the other side. Uh, we're sorry for the delay, but we want to, in large letters, see America slowly, and then we gave the route. And it was amazing how people would, so we just wanted to give people notice if traffic did build up behind us, that there was a reason for this trip. And in fact, we very rarely had a lot of traffic build up behind us. And that was just on the paved sections. There's yeah. other sections of the trail that, um, you can go for 300 miles in Wyoming on the original undisturbed ruts. It's quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So, but um, th it was it was interesting how quickly people saw that sign and got what we were doing. And people were very generous to you. Weren't oh, they? The, yeah. the, the hospital. The book's about um, the enormously enormous generosity of, of of people. Everywhere we went with the wagon, uh, you know, we'd get we'd get to a spot where it was obvious we were going to camp that night and there'd be two ranchers there fighting, fighting over, over who would get to host yeah, you. Who would get to host us, yeah. Well, um, you, with this book has been the New York Times number one bestseller for weeks and some of the critics had said part Laura Ingalls Wilder, mm -hmm. part Jack Kerouac. Right. The Oregon Trail is an idiosyncratic addition to the canon of American road trip right. literature. Right. It is full of these hilarious anecdotes. It's just mm -hmm. such a pleasurable read. But how Great do you thanks. feel about being part Laura Ingalls Wilder, Little House on the Prairie, yeah. and uh, part Jack Kerouac? I love, the, I love the part about being Jack, Jack Kerouac. I wasn't so familiar with um, Laura Ingalls Wilder work and actually when I then started to study her because people then started comparing the book I realized h how similar she was but I in fact it's kind of a demonstration of the gender differences in reading because she was primarily read by teenage girls teenage girls and and the boys were off I don't know reading the Hardy Boys or whatever and so um, but yeah it's a great feeling I think whenever um, they make literary analogies like that. It, it, it makes you feel like you are a part of a continuous movement to describe our country. Yeah. Um, you talk about this term, 
crazy ass passion. Sure. You just up and decided to do this. Mm-hmm. So, what role did crazy ass passion play in this? Yeah. Did people say you're crazy? Yeah, pe- a lot of people said we're crazy. You know, your wheels are going to break. The mules are going to run away. You don't know what you're doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and I just felt I had pr- a lot of personal reasons for going. I just recently divorced. I'd worked for a newspaper, and newspapers are kind of winding down and aren't great places to work anymore because of the web and so forth. But I just believe in crazy ass passion. Crazy ass passion is is what you know saved England, you know, during World War II. They were the last country in Europe to be free, and they stayed free because Winston Churchill was crazed enough to. So it's it, it expresses a determination, a willingness to take risk, uh, a never give up attitude. Yeah. And it's crazy because everyone else thinks you're nuts to do this. But to you, yourself, your personal autism is, well, I want to get there. I'm going to yeah. do it. It seems normal to me. Yeah. At the end of the book, you write, because uh, the, the other theme is uncertainty. I want you to talk yeah. about that in a minute. But at the end of the book, you say uncertainty is all. Mm-hmm. Crazy-ass passion is a staple of life, and persistence is its nourishing force. Without right. them, you cannot cross the trail. Right. S- so uncertainty. Yeah. Is that what your takeaway was? You're yeah, out there, big you takeaway know. of the trip is living with uncertainty. And I, I didn't really sense it that strongly when we started, though a little. But it was on a day when we'd struggled to find the trail and kind of got lost among the cliffs and the barriers up along the Sweetwater River in a very remote part of Wyoming. And I'd sit up at the wagon at night and say, smoking my pipe or finishing dinner and it's like how are we going to get out of this place and gradually I became comfortable with living with uncertainty and what we do as a culture today is we want to be certain you know these kids get out of college and they've had all the right internships and they know exactly the job they want at some software company etc etc everything has to be nailed down and certain but to accomplish something like this you need to live with uncertainty. You have to have that confidence that you're going to get up in the morning and what you expected isn't going to be there, and you have to make it up as you go along. Now, that was much more the way that people lived while this country was being created, particularly the pioneers. So living with uncertainty was a big takeaway and getting comfortable with uncertainty and just having short-term goals. All, right, all I have to do today is get 25 miles. I'll worry about, I'm going to move this wagon and this team of mules 25 miles west today on the trail. I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, One other theme, modern life wants to look at the destination, but one Mm -hmm. of the things you say through this journey is Mm -hmm. that the journey is a destination. Yeah, the journey is the destination. Because everyone asks me, well, how did you change, you know? I didn't really change that way. There was some confidence in things that came, but... I'm not a changed person from the trip. It was the journey that was the the, the miracle of it. And when you go back to the um, to the pioneers and look at their lives, and many of them wrote their journals of the trip years and mm. years later, but it was almost like World War II veterans, the greatest generation stuff. Um, everybody who crossed the trail in the 1840s and 1850s, 1860s, 18 retain this as a memory stronger than any other thing that ever happened in their lives and and there was almost like a fraternity out there of people who had crossed and it's interesting in the mail and the emails and stuff I get those traditions have continued with families because I I get you know my great grandfather crossed in 1853 blah 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 and very specific information so they either have the old journals or they have oral tradition or whatever Um, but the journey is all you know one of the other services you do in this book is to remind us there's a myth of history Mm -hmm. and there's a reality of history and you read everything about the trail sure and and what the actual settlers and survivors wrote is very different from the you know sugar spun myth oh the the sugar spun myth that we get I'll I'll give you just one example uh, that isn't appreciated today but Small town America in the 19th century was not a happy place. Something had happened called the uh, Great American Awakening, and people started leaving mainline congregations, like the old Congregational Church or or the uh, Church of England and so forth, for 
evangelical sects, like the Methodists and the Baptists. And then even within the Methodists and the Baptists, they started fighting over, you know, do we have a theory of the elect? Are we predestined? Or do we have to save ourselves? And all that kind of stuff. Small town America became rife with these battles. And they were very ugly battles. And whole churches would just say, we're leaving. We're going to go out west and hopefully we can find the peace and the religious elbow room that we need away from this awful little area of Illinois or something. And so religion drove people to the trail. Um, and we think it was economic need that drove them to the trail. It was both. Mm -hmm. But the, we, we don't t teach that. And the reason we don't teach it is it's considered verboten in schools to, to get into religion. religion. Yeah. So uh, yeah. women, women played a hugely important um, role in opening up the trail. And I write about one of them, Narcissa Whitman, uh, almost a whole yeah. chapter on her. The Indians uh, w were, were extremely friendly, and without them, the pioneers would not have gotten across. They became hostile, and we had Indian wars in the 1860s and 1870s, only after it became the policy of the federal government to annihilate the buffalo because we wanted to ranch and farm in that area. Um, and of course, then the Indians rebelled. So there's a lot of what they didn't teach me in history class element yeah. to this book. Yeah. Well, it's just got so many ups and downs. Speaking of ups and downs, I want to do show one yeah. picture of you're starting a very treacherous descent yes, here. Yes, yeah. That was near where we, we to, to cross the Rockies, we had to climb to 8,300 feet, 8,300 feet on the um, border of, uh, western border of Wyoming near the Bear River in Idaho. And once we got up there, a place called Dempsey Ridge, on the tail end of um, the, what was called the sublet cutoff of the Oregon Trail, which was a very, some of the cutoffs became more popular than the trail. <clears throat> From 8,300 feet, we had to descend to 2,000 feet in less than, excuse me, to 6,000 feet in about a mile and a half. Wow. And it was treacherous and scary, and it was fun to write about after it was over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't tell you, uh, we're, we've run out of time, sure. but, but what a pleasure it is to read this. Uh, the book, The Oregon Trail, A New American Journey, number, number one New York Times bestseller. Our guest today is Rinker Buck. Thank you so much for joining us and for having us embrace the journey, not the destination and the uncertainty. And thank you for your crazy ass passion that made you do such a thing. Thank you. I'm glad you got so much out of it, and I really enjoyed being here. You bet. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.